So I am now going to get out of the way and I am very excited to turn things over to Megan and really kind of a, a rock star panel of folks who are going to talk with us in some detail about what, you know, if you, if you follow all this in, in InfoSec Twitter, like everybody jokes about how uh, public private collaboration is the, the thoughts and prayers uh, of the community. It's kind of one of those oft thrown out there solutions for some of the problems we face. But what does it actually mean? What does it actually look like? What are people actually doing already? And what's it gonna look like going forward? So Megan uh, and to the entire panel, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. We're really excited about this conversation and let me get out of the way. Thanks very much, Philip. Uh, thanks to IST for including us in this panel. I agree that it is a rock star group. And so I will, without further ado, bring them on stage here. So we have about a little less than an hour to get through this conversation, and uh, I have been already instructed that I must stay on time. But in order to do that, um, but we also want to make this interesting and informative. So please, um, we have some questions that we've talked about that we think are interesting. We do want to be responsive to the interests of the audience. So you have probably already heard already how you can share some questions, but I would encourage you to again do so. And without further ado, again, I will uh, ask the panelists to introduce themselves in alphabetical order, and I will do my best to support the alphabetical order with uh, identifying Ginny as our first panelist to introduce herself. Thanks, Megan. Hey, everyone. My name is Ginny Bedanes. I am on the Defending Democracy program at Microsoft, and we work around cybersecurity issues as relevant to democratic institutions globally, and uh, really excited for this conversation today. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Jaya. Hi, I'm Jaya Balu. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Avast. And before that, I was the CISO at KPN. So also had the opportunity to work uh, on Jobs Snyder's project on implementing our PKI for our own infrastructure. So pretty cool. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Ted Miller Osborne. Hi, everyone. I'm Ted Osborne. I'm the Deputy Director of Threat Intelligence with Unit 42. Uh, and I head up the team that does all that public-private partnerships and threat intelligence sharing and all that kind of fun stuff. Excellent. And Mary. Hello, Mary Galloway. I am a customer success architect for Palo Alto Cortex team, and I am the CEO and a founding board member for the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. Super, it's great to have all of you here with us this afternoon. Um, I guess I'd introduce myself. My name is Megan Stiefel. I'm the Executive Director for the Americas at a, also a nonprofit called the Global Cyber Alliance. And we work to reduce cybersecurity risk by supporting operational implementation of known best practices. So um, we are gonna be talking this afternoon, not about thoughts and prayers, but about something that can be quite effective when deployed and supported uh, effectively. So uh, the, the subject, of course, of the panel this afternoon is future public-private partnerships and collaboration. And just in case anyone who's joining us is not familiar with uh, this long-standing now practice, we just wanted to set the table, so to speak, and, and kind of lay the foundation of what it is that we're talking about, who plays in this space, what do we mean by public-private partnership? We'll just spend a few minutes on this. Um, and I first wanted to kick it over to either Jen or Daya and ask kind of who the primary actors are, what mechanisms do they use to cooperate, um, and what do they bring to the table? Sure, I can get us started. Um, the primaries, as I would see it, are the large AV vendors and cybersecurity providers, um, as well as some larger entities that have very, very robust threat intelligence programs. So you're looking at larger organizations, say like a Northrop Grumman sort of or, sort of place, and it's teams where they have that kind of knowledge and in-depth understanding of what attacks are actually going on currently. And then the partnerships need to be with um, government and law enforcement organizations who can actually use that data. So organizations like NSA, Cyber Command, DISA, the FBI, um, now we're starting to look at things that we can potentially do with financial sanctions so that you know, expands who we can talk to. Um, but at a high level, those are, those are the players that, that I would to be the most important. Just to add to that, I would say that we also have a place for, you know, the whole plethora of folks that need that information and actually 
to operationalize it. So you have everything from the ISPs to like, I'm thinking of the uh, Isaacs, you know, you have a whole bunch of very strong information sharing communities. Um, in some countries, they're actually chaired by the National Cybersecurity Center in order to give them that body in order to allow sometimes competitors to join forces at a table and not make it look like they're colluding and unfair business practices. So it's really good uh, to have this kind of conversation, if you will, happen. And not only to tackle the bad guys, but also to figure out what are the best practices in defense and how does everyone share that kind of information to get it right the next time. And that yeah. more thing, I totally forgot about the ISAC. So I also wanted to mention organizations, say the Cyber Threat Alliance, where you have a large number of vendors that have come together that are sharing and organizations like the one that's hosting our panel today for the ransomware task force, which is doing the similar together a lot of different organizations that have those disparate data points to get everyone, you know, sharing and able to work together. Great. So we have we've we've heard we have private sector players either in the, <clears throat> their own form or through ISACs or ICE House or similarly the Alliance of Alliances that we sometimes refer to thinking about the Cyber Threat Alliance, there's also the Coalition um, for Cybersecurity Policy and Law. Uh, Ginny or Mary, anybody else we should bring to the table that we haven't identified so far? Well, it may go without saying that obviously government is going to be part of the public-private partnership. Um, but the only reason I highlight it is because that can mean different things. Um, you know, obviously people think about the federal level um, but even when you're talking about within the U.S. and the federal level, you still have to drill down. Are you talking about DHS and CISA? They're participants in a lot of this work. Or are you talking about NSA, FBI? There are all sorts of agencies. Then there's also the White House and the NSC. So it's it's a complex um, it's a complex weave of uh, different public sector actors. But that's just at the federal level. And depending on what the operation is, you might want to have local level governments uh, looped in as well. And then again, that's only referencing the US, which this is a global um, effort. These are global problems that we're dealing with. And in order to have a really effective public private partnership, again, depending on the target and what you're trying to accomplish, bringing in other governments is important as well. So that public sector, while maybe it seems uh, sort of obvious in just the name of it, I think it actually has some complexities to it as well. I was just going to add um, academia. We, just, we tend to forget about that side of things. There's a lot of information and a lot of folks that are in that space that should be a part of the conversation about information sharing because they're teaching the next generation of cyber professionals. So they need to have some say, some kind of input into what type of information is sharing and how do we take that and train the folks to be able to come into that field. So it sounds like there's a, obviously a broad mix of, of actors in this space. Is there one sweet spot for all of this to work itself out? Or is it, do we think that it's really kind of these hubs, if you will? That was one of the things we talked about in Ransomware Task Force report was this idea of a hub that might be spun up either to identify or respond to a particular incident, might be a particular industry group. Do you all have thoughts on, on informal or formality there? Well, I'm probably not the person to, oh, sorry, Jaya. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm probably not the one to speak on behalf of the Threat Intel um, folks because I'm sure they have their own perspective and you know we can hear what, what Jen has to say on that. But I know when I work with my Threat Intel people at Microsoft, the folks that we collaborate with, one of the things that I heard pretty loud and clear is how valuable the um, sort of analyst to analyst relationship can be, sort of those one to one relationships that have been built over time. And when you talk about the sweet spot, I don't think you're implying it, but just to be clear, we, we would want to continue to have these layers because there's so much value in some of those uh, conversations that happen on that individual level, but there are limitations too. Um, when they're having one-on-one -on -one conversations, they can really only share so much and, and they're all very responsible with what they're allowed to share and how. And so at some point you do need to level up to something a little more formal, more of a formal agreement maybe between companies or organizations. It can take longer when that happens, and that can be a shame at times when, when there is need for expediency. But there are also a lot of benefits that are derived from having a more formalized agreement, whether it's around a specific operation or if it's more of just an ongoing threat intel agreement between companies or between a, a public-private um, entity. So there is probably a sweet spot for a particular type of operation where it's like, oh, this thing is something where we're going to want to hub because there are so many actors. It's so complicated. Um, but there are other times when 
man, that one-to-one intelligence sharing, even though it might just be based on a trend or something anonymized, can really help move everybody forward. Um, So it's going to just, sorry, it's the worst answer ever when you're just saying, it depends, but it's going to essentially depend on what it is you're trying to accomplish. And and what I wanted to say is this actually uh, is kind of in line with what I wanted to say, except I am old and I have a particular fondness (laughs) for these relationships that were started in incident response with the CERT community. So, you know, when you know people and you've met them at the first conference and you have like established trust with a set of actors, not necessarily individuals, mind you, but a group that you think is capable of being able to take that intelligence and again, operationalize it to actually do investigative response and uh, do a notice and takedown if you need to, or work together with multi-parties and sort it all out. I, I'm a, still a, a kind of diehard fan of the CERT community. Mary or Jen, anything you wanted to add there? We already have a question for the audience, so I'll get that one in here too. If we... I, I'm actually similar to what Ginny was saying, where it depends. <laughs> and it's because for a similar reason that different types of the information sharing can be more effective depending on the task. Right, so if it's something that's specifically really targeted, you're only going to need a specific subset of people to understand it. But when you're looking at something like ransomware, which is a global problem for everyone, that's where you start to really need these larger groups because that's the only way we can address it because it's happening at, that's the way it's, the attacks are actually occurring, right? It's not my customers or your customers or their customers. It's everyone's customers being targeted at the same time. So you need that. And that's where I think it becomes complicated because A, that's a lot of people. And then B, um, that's potentially a lot of data that you're sharing. So there comes a lot of things where, um, you know, organizations that might be brought in where there aren't existing trust relationships. And that tends to be a lot of times where you start the formal kind of NDA paperwork, but also in the community for a lot of the threat sharing, there's kind of standard NDAs that we share back and forth. Um, So yeah, I hate to be on the it depends line, but same devil's in the detail. So recognizing that it depends, and and from my experience, I would completely agree. You mentioned a couple of things. One is this idea that there are, I think most sharing happens there is, it's informal, but there probably still is this paperwork process that people go through. There's an NDA that's been, been signed between parties. Um, one question is, a lot of this it begins with trust. So how do you, an audience participant asked, how do we ensure diverse participation and representation in these conversations when so much of this is happening informally? So how do you kind of, how do you break the, break into these groups um, and, and demonstrate, you know, is it, is it that you have to show your, um, your success before you can enter? Is it a, a bit of a chicken and the egg? You can't get in until you've got success, but you can't have success until you get in. What, what's been your experience? Um, and I'll ask uh, Jen if you don't mind first. She may be having some audio. Uh, pa- okay. Apologies. Um, I've seen, so that actually is a big thing on the current members of the community to actually mentor and bring in other people and sponsor them to bring them in. Um, Keeping it closed just because it's closed makes absolutely no sense. And I think you're seeing a lot more of that in the community as well, where there's a focus on mentorship and a focus on bringing in more diversity and representation um, because there's finally a recognition, at least more broad that that's what you actually need to be effective at your job right having a closed loop of feedback or information coming to you doesn't improve a product it doesn't improve a service it doesn't make for a better team it doesn't make for better analysts it makes for worse ones what you need are people with differing backgrounds so they can bring in different cultural components the different you know potential physical components the different experiential components and the different education that they've had both formally and from other jobs jobs able to do it and then you know introduce those people and bring them into the communities the same way we were when we were younger and starting and I think you're seeing um, a lot more of that unfortunately I don't think it's an easy thing to do like en masse but there's a lot more organizations such as 
women cyber did too, girls who code, a lot of things like that, where you're also seeing that focus on representation to be able to provide mentorship and training and skills for people that want to kind of break into the field. Yeah, and I, so to that point, um, not only is it our job as industry folks that are already in the industry, it's also the person that wants to get into it, their job to take some initiative and just go and talk to people and say, hey, I'm interested in this. How can I be a part of this community? How can I be a part of this conversation? And just have those conversations with people, right? Because they say a closed, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. So if you don't express that you have interest in this, nobody's really gonna know that you actually have interest in this to say, hey, come, come with me, let's, let's bring you along. So just putting a little bit of initiative out there uh, can go a long way to getting into the space too. So maybe this is a good point to kind of pivot to talking about the theoretical of this and talk about some of the, the actual incidents that have happened and how those how public private collaboration has worked or failed in those spaces. And that may also be a trigger for those who are kind of sitting on the sidelines wondering how they get into the conversation to hear about the experiences that y'all have had with working through some of these incidents over the past few years and, and what made them work. Um, so we really wanted to spend a couple of minutes thinking about, again, this, this question of of you know are there areas that, that we don't see about in the news that we would like for people to know really do work well um but also to kind of drill down a bit on those situations that have been discussed in the news you know we have the emotet takedown on, on one level on another level we had the we saw the successful use of the election integrity partnership um, around the 2020 elections in the united states what made these actions and these collaborative efforts successful from a public private partnership standpoint I'm going to kick it over to Jimmy first. Great. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about um, some of the really important work that went into making sure that the election side worked um, from from public private partnership standpoint. Um, you know, there were there were a series of meetings that were started. Um, gosh, I think probably in 2017 um, between some of the tech platforms who focused on issues around disinformation and elections. And of course, there were some teams like mine that were just sort of forming around that time to really take on the, those issues more directly. Um, and we started meeting with one another to really, it was about building trust. I mean, that, that's, there were a lot of things we talked about taxonomy and making sure when I said disinformation, it was the same thing that you meant just so that we could communicate clearly. And that was really, really important. And there were some great things that were discussed in those meetings. Um, and then we started bringing in government partners as well to these conversations. And we would all talk about some of the trends we were seeing, you know, just high level stuff. Um, but ultimately what I think was being built there were relationships and trust, which we've talked about already today. And um, so I'm really just emphasizing how important that was. I think it was someone from CISA within DHS who said, it's just so important that you're not exchanging cards during a hurricane. Um, and the idea is if something really bad happened around elections and we all needed to talk to each other or there was a local election official and they didn't know how to reach Microsoft with an issue they were having, you know, during an emergency is not the time to be like, well, I think I know someone over there and let me see if I can find an email address. You know, that's when you want to know the person, know how to reach them, know that they'll answer when you call and that you can have a conversation about what's happening, even if you're just introducing them. Um, and so a lot of what I think made that process successful specifically from the private sector perspective, which is of course, you know, where I'm coming from was the fact that we knew who our counterparts were within government, who we could talk to. We knew who to reach out to at the other tech platforms. And um, ultimately it was a very secure election, which is far more to do with what the uh, local election officials did, of course. Um, but the, the fact that we were able to support them, provide them with trainings, do what they needed and, and build that trust with them, I think was a, a big part in, in a successful election. Thanks, Jenny. So it, it sounds a, in part that we often think about um, organizations reaching out to the government. So we, we tell people to be prepared, have your incident response plan, introduce yourself to law enforcement before the hurricane or the ransomware incident happens. But I think one thing I'm, I'm mindful of as you're speaking is also the need to make sure that you know who your, supply, your suppliers are, so to speak. So. Um, thinking in particular about Jaya's prior experience and, and even now too, it, you know, if you need to reach your um, ISP, uh, if you have a major issue or even thinking about ahead of time, building those relationships early. Um, uh, Mary, can I turn to you for anything further on, on the kind of thinking about what's been, what's worked well and what, why, how did that happen? Honestly, I, I think a lot of it works because of communication. 
as Jenny said, you're, you have to stay in constant communication with people. You can't just have this conversation like the four of us having this conversation right now, and then we leave and never talk to each other again. You know what I'm saying? Like we're all resources and you have to, you have to communicate what it is you're working on, what it is you need, what it is you're doing so that when that time comes, it's just a, Hey, I need your help or Hey, I need your advice or Hey, I need your input. And I think anything that works in the world is because of communication period. And then once you have communication, you can put a plan together. You can start implementing, you know, you can start adjusting as you need to, as things happen, as things go on. But that's probably the biggest, biggest thing. So if we think about communication from an organizational standpoint and then kind of building out from that, a circle around that, who are you working mostly to communicate with? What do you think is sort of top of your list of, I need these five people to know, or these three people, or maybe it's these 20 people to know that what's going on or, or that they will be called upon if I have a question? Who, um, where should someone begin if they're thinking about building their own uh, network to, to respond to these types of issues and prepare for them? I'd say definitely internal in the organization. Start looking at who the different stakeholders are in your business that can can help you. The legal team, you know, the networking teams. The I was I worked in a casino for a while, so in our respect, it was the casino operations teams that if something happened, we knew who to talk to, who to reach out to, and then externally, um, definitely the different ISACs. So we did a lot of collaborations with. Um, the RHI SAC. And so there's like Slack channels and there's all types of communication going on back and forth in there. It's like, hey, we see this. Do you guys see this? Or hey, here's some intel on what's happening. Um, I think for me, that would be the first places that I would go to, to make sure that I have those connections. And I know that those people also have resources that'll be helpful for, for us. Thanks, Mary. Shia, do you have anything from, you've been now in kind of two different places that many of, all of us have really, but, but most recently. Um, you know what I think is super useful is something that I think from a global perspective really works well, uh, which is the stuff that Europol has done. They had a quite, I think, an advanced philosophy early on to establish advisory groups based on different industry consortium. Um, and to be honest, like I was a bit skeptical initially, uh, I was part of the communication service providers group and now I'm part of the, uh, you know, security providers group. And, but what both of those consortia allow Europol to do is test ideas, figure out what works, um, really also kind of test their own technical metal. Um, no offense to Europol, but I don't usually equate law enforcement and large government agencies with a high degree of technical affinity. So, um, and again, this is obviously not true everywhere, but this was certainly true uh, at the time. And what they've done is they've proven that they can be a valid speaking partner, that they want to be a speaking partner rather than someone who's only dictating uh, policies or demanding uh, certain actions. So I, I thought that was really useful. Um, so it's kind of a combination of figuring out who they want from different organizations. So it's both a little bit of that internal scouting as well as that external uh, stakeholder management within these groups is really good. The only one I would add would be um, make friends with your local FBI office. Figure out who the agent is there that would work cases with you and you know have some initial conversations and start building a relationship with them in the chance that a they can share information with you and potential threat intelligence with you that they get through um, FBI channels and also just you have that touch point if there is an issue where you know who to reach out to you have an existing relationship you know you know I, I need to call this person and they'll pick up the phone right away um, and that's always good to have in advance I would agree with that as a former DOJ person uh, the agents are your can be your best friends but but there can be a degree of, of skepticism and real hesitance and fear, in fact, of going to talk to the FBI um, or going to talk to a partner that you may have information that, that either puts your or own organization or their organization in, in perhaps a less than favorable light unless one is able to, again, peel back the onion and figure out what's really going on. And so the a question from the audience has been, um, what are examples of formats that allow for kind of breaking through that, that fear and that um, hesitancy, reluctance to, to kind of extend the, extend the olive branch to say, I, I, want to, I want to talk to you about something. How do we get this conversation going? 
Is there um, any tricks that either any of you have had from your own experience that have led the way, paved the way for success? Is, do you think that the question is referring to interacting with government or more like creating sort of a collaborative environment? Well, I, I guess, think, yeah, could be both, but I think it's um, mostly the latter of, of thinking between, between private sector entities. I just want to be careful because when it comes to the, <laughs> when it comes to creating a relationship with the FBI, you probably talk to your internal legal office before anyone else to make sure that you get that set up. So I don't necessarily want to give the wrong advice there. Um, but I mean, I know we've mentioned ISACs a lot, and so I don't want to overemphasize it. However, ISACs is re are, are really a great place to find people within your industry who care about the same things as you in a very safe place. Um, I'm not a member of many, but, you know, obviously Microsoft is, and I participate in a couple. And from what I've witnessed in those, in those environments, they have regular calls where they give updates and you can get to know who other members are. Potentially, when we get back to a place where there's a real world, you could actually identify some of those folks and get to know them in person if that's appropriate. Um, but it's almost more of a networking exercise, right? I mean, you you can anonymously show up to those calls and hear what's going on, or you can try and identify who are some of the participants and can I get to know them and build out a relationship? Um, because once you start to network a little bit more within that community, then you'll have essentially created that safer space for you. You'll feel more comfortable uh, working in that way. And, and ISACs aren't the only one, but that's just that's a, if there's one for your industry, man, that's just a place where everyone is gathering. They care about the same thing. They're going to, they're going to be similar to you in that way. And they're probably good folks for you to know if you don't already. Sure. And so for those who may not be up on our lingo, it's information sharing and analysis centers. Um, there are also information sharing and analysis organizations. And oftentimes the centers are broken down by critical infrastructure sector. Um, Jenny, you mentioned that ISACs are one. And so as you were speaking, I was thinking about the sector coordinating councils and if we can talk just for a few minutes about kind of the difference between those and, and whether uh, if someone is kind of new to this space or if, if you think that if you've had experience, if anyone uh, had experience with those two uh, communities of interest, whether one seems to be um, more formal and one is more operational or if there is any way to distinguish them um, if someone has to choose or kind of wants to get their toe wet. I mean, I'm happy to speak to it. I feel like I just talked a lot, but I, we, I participate in um, the sector coordinating committee for, um, for within DHS for the elections community. And um, we also participate in the EI ISAC, the ISAC for election infrastructure. And just from that experience, I'd say the SEC is a great environment, but it is far more formal. Um, it's smaller, it requires a vote to be included. Typically, um, you have to sort of demonstrate that you're appropriately fitted, your company is the appropriate fit for whatever that critical infrastructure component is. Um, uh, whereas the ISAC, to your point, Megan, is a little bit broader, uh, more about information sharing, gathering together, um, and, and sending that out to people who it might be relevant to. Um, so I, I recognize I speak with fairly limited expertise, but I think it's about right that the sector coordinating um, councils are going to be smaller and a little bit more selective, a little more formal, and the ISACs are going to be broader, more of a place for gathering information, less where you produce something, more where you, where you receive, and of course you share if you have something to share with the group. Megan, can I add something here? So I think this is really interesting because we don't have this type of formalized structure uh, for the ISACs outside of the United States. So in the country that I'm in, in the Netherlands, um, the ISAC is actually it's just that. It's just one ISAC. So there's no SEC next to it. And it's the same. It's invitation only. Uh, it is quite formal. Again, it's chaired by the NCSC to make sure the competitors can speak. Um, but what's really interesting is the hookup from the Dutch ISACs back. So like, for example, the financial services ISAC that we have, you know, in the Netherlands also talks to the FS ISAC in the US. There is a link, which I think is phenomenal. Um, but what's also different is that there's also an annual meeting where all of the ISAC um, chairs and vice chairs come together and they, again, do a sort of higher level information sharing to talk about combined threats. And of course, there's reporting done on this basis because I have to say one of the suckiest things is these are choices that we make, right? When we wanna be part of these committees, but there's always, of course, like mandatory required communities that we have to be part of because of some sort of mandatory reporting duty. 
Um, and so like from that perspective, like what I find so disappointing is you don't always get the information back. So you might have to report something for data breaches or privacy or blah, 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 and you don't get a lot back. And that's why I think the treasure is there with the ISAC community, because when you have something and you disclose in a safe space, you get information back, you find out if someone else has seen the same thing, you can enrich that information again and add to your own telemetry. It's uh, super cool compared to the mandatory regulatory stuff. So I wonder if we should pivot a bit to to the to talk about Emotet, um, and so I'll kick it over to Jen perhaps to, to kick the conversation off. But um, to the extent that you can, I want to say whether there was a large role or participation level from kind of the ISAC-driven uh, community, or whether you saw if you have um, kind of more of the conversation evolving out of what we know of trust circles and, and lots of different Slack channels that people are trading information between and um, do we think that that's by virtue and part of the type of um, subject matter of the response, as opposed to, for the example, in the election space, um, that maybe these different types of um, both parties involved, but also the subject matter of the incident, where we're thinking not only about cybersecurity issues, but also about disinformation and misinformation. Um, is there any way to break those apart, or is it? Again, it goes back to it depends, and that's good too. Um, in some cases, it depends. For a couple of the recent ones, it's been largely partnership between um, larger organizations that have good visibility and threat intelligence tracking, whether they were a vendor or um, an ISP or a hosting provider, people that really had large data sets to be able to go through and potentially large global data sets and that was one of the keys for something like say emotet because you need that global level of perspective for tracking um, and then working with international and local law enforcement to coordinate those types of relationships and operations are starting to happen uh, more frequently especially as we're seeing success with some of the initial starting components um, what I really think we need to see now is we need to take these wins that we've had where we had a large number of players to some extent, but you know, definitely wasn't everyone who could have come to the table who would have had data or global. And I think we need to start moving these both faster. They need to be able to happen more at speed, which is going to be difficult, but I don't know that the goal is, hey, let's let these people make a couple million dollars before we stop them is really kind of a win-win scenario. And then we also need to um, improve and deepen the global components to it. So we can potentially say, we know X is going to kick off this day, or if something new has kicked off, share the threat intelligence and the signatures. Um, so we can, from, uh, we can all basically turn everything off that day, whether it's with the ISPs, whether it's rolling out protections, whether it's coordinating, sort of arrest or public disclosure or financial sanctions, but being able to actually stop these things before the attackers are making a ton of money, um, and then being able to publicize that, right? So it points to other people, hey, if you do this, you're going to get caught. You're going to go to jail. There's going to be ramifications for you. Because right now, I think the biggest problem we're saying doing this, even if they manage to kind of arrest them eventually, they're making millions and millions of dollars beforehand. And a lot millions and walking away and that needs to need to be able to discourage that kind of behavior and I think that's what we're really gonna gonna need from a capabilities perspective moving forward to do it so you mentioned um, speed uh, additional bringing additional players to the table and um, kind of broadening the scope of, of information that they they will bring what do you think um, Mary or, or Jaya is kind of the if, the one, if there's one thing that you could do to improve the situation, recognizing you might want to do 10 things, but if there were one or two things that you could have your wish list to do or fix, what would those be? 
Well, I, I have to say, you know, we could improve the automation of some of the sharing that we do and we could improve like some of the fundamentals because there's not a lot of reasons for some of this stuff to exist and occur. And the countries that I always look to that always get it right are uh, countries like Israel, you know, who really have a, almost a nationally oriented vulnerability management program to make sure that these infections will not be successful in the first place. That also like who has a 911 line to report security incidents? You know, they're, they're, I find these types of practices so enlightened uh, in a way and um, so heavily part of a sort of security aware culture that I have yet to see it really taken on board in other places. What I still find shocking is the amount of critical infrastructure and pick a country, name one, because we'll all find it. Um, which is still suffering like from exchange vulnerabilities, you know, which is and like in my own country, it's been no different. So th there's it's just everywhere. And that for me um, is unacceptable. And if they can scan it, so can we. So why don't we just take it away before it's exploited? Mary, I think you were going to say something a minute ago. And I think you were saying a little bit. No, okay. Um, so I think Israel is an interesting case, it, and I will not put it on my lawyer hat, but I, you know, there are, of course, um, national level laws that may be, some might say, prescriptive or limiting of, of, of participants, participants' ability to engage in a particular issue. And you can think about sort of some of the standing requirements or, or limitations in particularly in some of the Southeast Asian or Asian countries of the world. Um, is there, does that amend? probably a self-evident question to say, does it matter? But is there, how do we just, does public-private partnership work in those cases? And we're thinking about, we really need to, we've identified something, does that change the situation? Is there anything more that can be um, done to advance, again, the broadening of this network and bringing more data to the table to have a broader, imp bigger impact more quickly? I don't know who wants to take that, if anyone. <laughs> I'm just going to make a shot at the Israel bit, uh, and then I'm going to leave it to you guys. But I was going to say, do, do you guys know that if you ever, like, I mean, I always have this experience every time I'm in Israel, and if I speak about a particular subject or a company or a problem, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, Yadi, I served with him in blah, blah, blah. You know, everybody knows everybody, and it is a small country, and it, I think that those are the types of relationships that is a sort of um, ambition in cybersecurity that you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I know Jan, I was on a panel with her. It's all good. I'll just call her up and we'll sort it out. You know, that, that's really what you want to be in a position to be able to do. And um, I think that we need to try to figure out how we get that um, automation and rapidness built in with our relationships. So we're not that great at building them and maintaining them, but if we could add telemetry and action to the mix, then I think we'd be in a better position. So success stories is one of the, the, the things that I had left off when, when Jen was talking about it, which is kind of where we began. I, I think we, well, I'll only speak for myself. I think the elections, uh, the way the elections went down was, was a good, big success. And Jenny, I totally agree with you that it really is hats off to the state and local election officials who worked through those issues and, and got us to where we are today. Um, is, there, uh, is there more that can be done to help that these success stories emerge. So if we think about organizations that may be reluctant to, part to partner with the government or organizations that may be unsure about partnering with each other, we, we I know, have not always succeeded in doing after actions of major incidents because we're always off onto the next one and we don't seem to be getting a break from that pattern. But it strikes me that, that some sort of form of after action, less focused on what went wrong, but what went right, um, can we think of any examples where that's happened recently or, or is there something, is there a, uh, it, it, we can have a, a gentle woman's agreement to try and do more of that in the future. Any thoughts on that front? Um, I mean, this is probably not an area where we want to emphasize on the elections <laughs> as far as uh, talking about what happened. Uh, and people should do that. They are doing that. I just, I just mean, I'm not sure that's the perfect example of what you're getting at. Um, I, I know I, for one, would love to read sort of the, the verbal history, um, oral history is what I want to say, the oral history of the Emotet takedown, you know, um, if, and maybe that exists and I just haven't been exposed to it, 
but I know that I've, whenever I read oral histories of like how this movie was made or what happened during this particular incident, it's always a really engaging way to walk through an activity and really understand the players, you know, to your point, Jaya, it's, it gives you a sense of like who was involved and what was their role. Um, my guess though is a lot of that has not happened because of the sensitivity of the work that's being done here. Um, as wonderful as it would be, and I maybe a, a aspiring journalist out there can figure out a way to do it while still maintaining a lot of the secrecy and privacy. I know when we wanted to have an internal sort of blog about some of the work we did around elections, even our own internal teams passed on talking about it um, because they were like, oh, I don't think I need to tell the world or even Microsoft employees about the role I played because it, you know I, I do this work on, um, on other security incidents as well. And it just felt like it was uncomfortable for them. So I think you're dealing with a community that doesn't like to talk super publicly about, about incidents like this or not incidents, projects, organizations like this. Um, I, for one, would read it, um, but um, but I think the bigger challenge might be the sensitivity of the information and of the people who would be delivering that. I think to uh, Jenny's point, too, you have to find that balance of there's some stuff you can share, like some of that high level stuff, but I'm not going to tell you that, you know, I was hands on keyboard doing these things to get to this point, right? Um, so I think finding finding a level of trust and being able to balance what you can and can't share and do it anonymously, right? I think, I, I think the, the good points that happen in these different um, successful incidents and these successful takedowns and that stuff, it's really important that we know what that is, right? So that we can continue to do that same kind of work in the future. If we don't know, then we'll be back in the same situation trying to figure out, okay, how do we figure this out? How do we make sure this is as, as successful as it was before? So it's definitely, you got to find that balance and that comes with trust in organizations and people have to trust that if I share this, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm not going to get in trouble. I'm not going to get arrested. I'm not going to get any of that, that bad stuff. I'm wondering maybe if, if perhaps it already happens in, in ISACs and the like, if there is a, an element of, hey, we just worked through this particular issue. And, and even if it's at a level of abstraction where we're able to kind of participants in the ISAG, not necessarily the public, but of course, I think there's, there's interest from the public and, and having the public know a little bit more does help advance the policy conversation. Um, we've got two questions from the audience related to, to the conversation that we're having. The first is thinking about um, the frustration that, that many have, and I know Philip and I have talked about this over too many years now to mention this idea that public private partnerships work but they don't scale um so how do we how can we move the ball forward if if we're still kind of in this first and second gear level of of in some cases we just get lucky and that's how major takedowns happen um is there a way to push beyond that or, or are we still kind of in a maturity level of of dealing with cybersecurity across the ecosystem from some players are quite advanced. Some governments have a different type policy approach and regulatory and legal framework that allows them to be much more assertive and aggressive, and others don't. Can we? Are there any takeaways from that conversation or inject points? I feel you know a lot of it comes from planning. I think you can find that if you're planful about what you're trying to accomplish. We're not talking about reactionary operations. Obviously, we're talking about. Um, you know, thinking through how we're going to take down a series of botnets or how we're going, like if, if you have a central authority that is trusted, and maybe that is um, the government, it, maybe it's a private sector actor, but there needs to be buy-in and then planning. I think you could scale some of those things, but within, um, maybe within, uh, with some restrictions, I guess, like ransomware is one that could be taken on. In fact, the ransomware task force put some great recommendations out there around this that would sort of essentially create a longer term, more scalable way for public private partnerships to engage on massive ransomware takedowns. I mean, I think that creates a nice blueprint that if you have the right thoughtfulness and planning, you would see that. Like, of course, you're not going to have like a giant pri private public partnership that's going to react to every cyber incident and take down every cyber actor. That doesn't scale because that just seems impossible and, and too large. Um, so it's probably somewhere in the middle. I think there could be less one-offs, more concerted efforts around particular topics um, or targets. And then I do think you could see some level of scale. Um, but yes, it's never going to be the panacea of taking out all cyber threats, um, you know, internationally. That's just not feasible. 
You know, but to, to kind of add to that, I think that's really relevant. There was something that someone else said. It was actually um, the guy who is the head of the National Cybersecurity Center here. He said, it's not so much about partnership, but about participation. So you have a group of people and you always have a couple of one, them that are lurkers, you know, that wait for someone else to do the heavy lifting or this monitoring or the, you know, and they, and I think really a, a successful like partnership means that everyone's vested, you all show up, you all do the work, you all try to figure out what capacity you can help. And that's not a given, um, especially sometimes with information sharing, obviously it's based on trust, but there also tends to be um, a predisposition for certain agencies to collect and not share. Um, and that might be well warranted, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to engage the right community and then engage their participation as well. So there's got to be like a sort of consensus on both sides of what they're willing to bring in. And, you know, a perfect example is this BGP uh, problem that was just talked about. I can tell you BGP hijacks are happening all the bloody time. You can find them on Twitter. You find them everywhere. Someone is rerouting traffic all over the place. And yet we as a community haven't rallied around 150 K. Are we kidding? You know, just to have an additional validator, there should be the kind of stuff that a true partnership would embrace and say, right, let's all like get into action and do something about this because it affects everyone. Yes, I mean, I, I, we at GCA agree on that front. I think many of us also agree on that, on the question of particularly thinking about um, BGP and RPKI. So, the another question, two more questions from the audience. One is around um, how much more public-private partnerships, but I do like the participation uh, idea instead, can engage in terms of operational collaboration short of hackback. And I, I'm not sure that there's too much. But we've sort of talked through a, a bunch of this. I would we could have a conversation around hackback. I don't think it would be a very lengthy one. But but if, if anyone disagrees with me that hackback is not a good idea, um, please speak up. <laughs> Otherwise, um, you know, thinking about uh, what's what what's next for public private par partnerships and participation. Um, is it we've you know is it more events like Emotet? Is it is there something more that we can do? That, that, that I think that's where the question is headed. Is there more that can be done that doesn't involve hackback? to further reduce, for example, the likelihood of an impact of ransomware? Honestly, I continued collaboration. You know, you have to want to partner and you have to want to participate and work with other groups to secure stuff. This whole thing with um, the colonial uh, pipeline, you know, there, there's litigation against them now because they failed to do something. Right, that's going to set a precedent if if the state of Georgia wins. Now, now you're going to be required to do these collaborations and work with these different organizations and partner and share information. So instead of being required, let's just do it. Right, let's continue to have these conversations and have these forums and have you know tabletop exercises and information sharing exercises. Um, you know, take the attribution out, give just the basic stuff. Um, it's it's gonna take it's gonna take a continued willingness to collaborate to move this thing forward and to get something firm and in place. There's a lot of stuff already in place, but if we want to continue to do more things and globally, you know, we have to work because cybersecurity is not just U.S. or Europe or Australia. It's a global issue, right? And these companies are global companies, so we have to think on a bigger scale when it comes to what we're trying to do. So part of what I hear you saying, Mary, maybe, is there may be an issue of maturity. So those who want to participate may be more mature, uh, or may, have, in terms of their cybersecurity capabilities, they may be mature, more mature in the sense that they may be more successful. Um, so they have more at risk if they don't uh, manage these issues more carefully. But is it a, an issue of maturity? Um, is it is it a question of incentives so that even smaller organizations? who may not have a huge budget would still want to, for example, take some minimum steps to ensure their cybersecurity, but going back to this whole, it's an ecosystem, right? So if I'm insecure, that in some ways, if I'm a small entity, maybe it makes you minorly insecure, but we can point to a number of incidents in the past where it's been the small fish that's ultimately led to the, the larger fish getting breached. What do you all think about the maturity versus um, incentives question? 
I think, I think it's this is both. a really, sorry. Sorry. Oh, I think it's both for um, one of the things I think that's going to be key for this being effective moving forward is going to be maturing the process with organizations. And I think that will also help with getting smaller organizations willing to come on board because there'll be a structure and a process. If you have a small team, no matter how good they are, if it's very manual to do this, it's going to be really difficult to kind of carve that time up. So part of it's going to be maturing the program so things can be shared easier, more in a automated format. Um, and I think then also more highlighting of the value that you get from these public-private sharing, what, the kind of threat intelligence and things that you can potentially get. When you're part of these organizations and working groups, a lot of times they're sharing threat data that isn't necessarily public, right? It's not necessarily in virus total or anything like that. It's things that they're seeing that they've pulled that now they're sharing indicators with other organizations. So it actually exponentially increases the amount of protection offered to an organization when they are a part of these partnerships and they do share back and forth because they get relevant actionable data that they can use. And that really, to echo, I think, everyone on the panel so far, that's really the key to the success of all of these is people have to be engaged and they have to do the back and forth. And that includes the law enforcement and government. That's a shift that they've slowly been making and they're going to need to continue to make because historically that's been one of the reasons private sector wasn't interested. If we are just going to take our data and not give us anything useful, that was a waste of my time. I can go share it with my competitor organization and they'll share back data that's useful to me. So when you start looking at it that way, I mean, it kind of makes sense. One thing I would add, going back to sort of the original question of what are other things that could be done other than um, the hack back uh, scenario is, you know, we've talked a lot today about operational solutions, which are incredibly important, but there are policy solutions um, out there as well. And there's a, um, you know, what used to be sort of the public domain, meaning only really something that governments worried about or, or took care of is really turned into a multi-stakeholder domain. Um, tech companies in particular have a vested interest in, in what is happening in cyberspace and how their tools are being used and leveraged. And so I think it's interesting to think about other things that can be done, like uh, joining organizations like the Tech Accord um, or the Charter of Trust or the Paris Call for Peace in, cyber, in uh, cyberspace. You know, these are multi-stakeholder groups that are made up of government and industry and civil society who are essentially calling on larger institutions such as the UN and other places to put some norms in place to create some boundaries so that um, if a nation state themselves cross those boundaries or if they enable it, um, that there are methods by which uh, we can all sort of say, okay, that's the red line. We all agreed it's been crossed. And now here are the, here are the responses that we're going to collectively take. I recognize that a lot of companies feel like they don't play in that space or that that's not up to them. Um, but of those organizations I just listed, any, any company essentially can join them. Um, those are, those are not just government institutions anymore. These are these are really multi-stakeholder organizations. So I just encourage folks to think beyond just the technical solutions that are in place and consider that there might be other ways to get to what Jen is referring to, essentially the root of the problem. How do we create more deterrence on this? And that might be one way to do that. I couldn't agree more. So we have a little less than a minute left. Um, and I was going to ask a controversial question, but since I can't ask it, I'll just throw it out there, which is to say, who do you wish was at the table who isn't there? Um, uh, and we could set, you know, we could identify authoritarian regimes and their willingness to continue to operate as safe havens, but that's the subject of a future conversation, I hope. Um, anybody want to take that one on? You can put, do it at a level of abstraction so you're not identifying partners or competitors. Otherwise, I think what we'll do is wrap up and say, you know, what are the, the couple of takeaways are really you know, the biggest takeaway, I think, is, is something that Jaya made, which is an observation she made, this idea of participation. So it's rather than partnership per se, you really need to get in the game. And, and there is an element of participation, but excuse me, of partnership, but their participation and giving something to get something. Um, you may not need to get something to have a, to have impact. Giving it is, can also be effective. I want to thank our panelists and thank IST for hosting. Any final words from our panel? Participate. <laughs> <laughs> and IST, thanks again. And thank you to you, Megan. Uh, sincerely appreciate everyone making the time from the panel to, to dig into some of these issues here today. It's incredibly important.
that people do participate, you know, looking at the the ransomware task force that we just completed, really the call to action there for just by way of example, there's so much that can be done now in terms of collaboration 